and fun. It's okay, like, well, I'll stand here, but the two rows with the pink flag on either side of me are ones where we worked. So today we're going to review briefly this big nationwide project that was funded three years ago by the federal government in what's called the SERI program. It has scientists in New York, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, North Carolina, Washington State. And in each one of those locations, we're trying to work with companies and with growers and with physiology horticulturists like myself to better define and help growers adopt precision crop load management. So precision crop load management is something we've talked about for a number of years now. And so I wanted to just, Bobby, if you'd come stand by me, I just have a couple of questions for you. It all begins with pruning. You said pruning bud ratios. Tell us what you do as far as pruning. Okay, I'll, I'll stay with this orchard because we, we have a lot of different different training systems here. But this block, it, we've came down lower than like 1.8. It, it's probably, it's been closer to 1.1 to 1.5 in that, in that range for this time crisp. So, yeah. And for Gala, it, it's right there. It's at the 1.9 to 1. Okay. So what he means by that is that uh, in the dormant season, we get an estimate by counting. And we hope in the future, Jenny and uh, well, I'll just pick on Jenny. I'm not going to say her last name because I don't want to embarrass her in public. But that a camera will count the number of buds in the dormant season. And then he decides how many flower buds he wants and prunes close to that number. So if well, tell us again, on these B9s, how many fruit you want per tree? We really want like 50 to 65, and we're in that range. But we, we usually say, let's get 70 to 80. And, and that's my personal feeling on how, when we look at the models and we look at kind of our predictions, that's where we set it is a little bit higher than where we are. For buds or for fruit? That's for fruit. Okay. For buds, just times that by, it's in that one one to one five, depending on the year. This year was a little less flowers than here. We had a big crop in here last year, so we were a little closer. But um, yeah, that one five is a good. So that if we just use that number of sixty five, we would multiply that by one point five. That's it's just going to add another thirty some. So it's around ninety seven, ninety eight flower clusters that we want to leave on these trees when we're done pruning. Now in an on year they might have 300. In an off year they might have only 100. And so in the off year you would prune just a little, maybe reduce it down to 90. But in the on year then you need to reduce it a lot by substantial pruning. Now the problem with Honeycrisp it has these vast cycles in up and down. Now you said something earlier that made my heart happy because that's something I've preached now for many years that you have been using Blossom ATS sprays, you said for foliar fertilizer because that's the only way it's legal, but it's for Blossom thinning. Now do you feel your ATS program has stopped this sort of massive bloom and no bloom, massive bloom and no bloom? <clears throat> yes, it has. Where our canopies are controlled and not blown out from vigor. It really helps, and you can you can really get consistent yields over that 50 bins an acre, as long as you get it down by 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 like early June. Late June is kind of is too late. It, it's more of a textbook, but it needs to be. If you want the big crops, it needs to be very early June. You need to almost be doing just minimal hand thinning. And it's scary, but we thin honeycrisp almost as hard as gala as hard as Gila to try and get the target. But it, it has to be precise. Okay, so we'll get a little more into the precision part of his thinning program in a sec, but I do want to emphasize that I've had so many growers tell me that once they started on a regular ATS program, they tended to even out honey crisp. You still have the on year and the off year, but not this bust year of zero clusters. That is depressing when you have no flowers, and that's what we want to avoid. Now, this project covers many different aspects. One of them is the ATS using the pollen tube growth model, which I'm not going to spend any more time on here. But another aspect of it is trying then to 
to fine tune the post bloom thinning sprays. And for that, we use a carbohydrate model. Now, Bobby, you said you get loaded up on carbohydrates mm -hmm. when we get to the thinning season by, by eating donuts, but just by the model. Yeah. So tell us what you did this year, and then I'm going to have to say what I think happened. Okay. <laughs> this, this block looks like a home run, but most of that is because of the deficit we had. But the deficit did take us right to the edge of the cliff. Um, we did try and stay away from the deficit with our sprays. Acknowledging that was was hard to do. Um, that just you just have to look at that model every day or twice a day to, to try and stay away from those big swings down. And I think the only other thing is I just don't like a lot of carbaryl, a little bit right, with, per hundred, and just adjust it with NAA. And then I mentioned a little bit earlier, just a spreadsheet. We just keep a spreadsheet. So this, there's probably 50, 60 acres here. There's like 20 acres of honeys, but there's they're broken up on a spreadsheet by generations. And, and rootstock probably. And rootstocks. And, but also keep track of the history the year before, et cetera. So there's a lot of multiple sprays, but it allows you to fine tune it more so. So as you all recall, we got through bloom, it was beautiful. We had a frost, it tight clustered a peak. And some people really lost a lot of kings, others didn't. Did you lose many kings? Here, Here. Yeah. yeah, on the bottom. And so people were then worried about, what do I do thinning? I've lost a lot of kings. And then we came into the thinning window. And this is where it got really complicated, right around petal fall. We had rain, and so people had to delay the petal fall spray a day or two. Thursday of that week dawned good, and I said spray. So a lot of people put a spray on Thursday of that week. Friday was a nice day. Saturday was a nice day. Sunday was a nice day. People close to the lake were a little bit delayed, and so they were either going to go Monday or Tuesday. But Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday turned out to be really hot, 90 degrees. Worse, the nighttime temperatures were above 62 degrees. Now, just keep that in the back of your mind. Anytime nighttime temperatures are above 60 during thinning period is dangerous. And that's what happened this year. So people that applied Thursday at the, what we call the petal fall spray had the chemical, let's say NAN carbaryl, working in the plant Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, four days, maybe a little bit on Monday. But then they had this heat, which produced massive carbohydrate deficits Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Now, I said at the time, we had our meeting on Wednesday that we're three days too late. I apologize for that. Many of you sprayed when you shouldn't have. And so there was some over thinning this year because of that. I'm trying to figure out how to better protect the industry from over thinning situations. We've never had 90s in the, in the petal fall period, but this year we did. We had it two years ago in the Hudson Valley, so I already had that experience of over thinning there with these 90 degrees and 60 degree nights. But I'm not a, well, um, well, I'm not going to say the person's name. A person was kind of frustrated with me. I'm modifying what the carbohydrate model says on the text recommendations to be a little more blunt about don't spray on these kinds of conditions whenever we have deficits of minus 50, minus 60, minus 70, minus 80. Now, on this side of the city, the deficits were in the minus 50, minus 60 range. But at Ferber's farm in Soda, so using that weather station, we had deficits in the minus 80, minus 90. Those are dangerous. So now you have thinner on top of that, you get massive thinning. Now, for Gala, maybe in some cases it worked out. We had Gala's thin to singles first time ever in my lifetime with the bottoms over thinned, yes, but we really thinned them down heavily. But a lot of honey crisp were over thinned. But that's part of this issue with uh, precision crop load management. It's always going to have this variable effect of the weather. And I hope with the modifications I make in the carbohydrate model this summer and this winter, and we'll introduce them more clearly next spring, it will help protect you against problems. I also have some new strategies for when we have the opposite, which is cool weather and a carbohydrate surplus, and we can get thinning, and that's what happened to us in 2022. Now, in 2022, nobody thinned gale enough, 
They all came to harvest with more of the fruit than they needed. And we had some galas blank out this year because of too many apples in 2022. That can happen. And so the opposite of when we get too much or too much carbohydrate in a tree and we can't thin is an equally important problem. And I hope that this project will end up with tools that are very clear to help growers avoid either the over thinning or the other thinning. Now, um, I do want to commend you, Bobby. I hope others can take some of your experience that being able to even out the bloom on honey crisp so that we're not 100% any one year is the goal. And you can do that with aggressive blossom thinning. You can do it, I think, the best with ATS, but I think you can also do that with NA at you, bloom. You said, he said aggressive. You have to be aggressive at bloom. You can't mm -hmm. nibble, it, it, it just in my opinion. You've got to go out there and get it. And by the time you get to that, that uh, 10, 12 millimeters, I don't even think some of these got received that 10 to 12 millimeters spray. So that's the first part of what I wanted to present. Now, the second part is that as we thin and bloom, and as we thin and petal fall and at 10 millimeters, we've got to know how much thinning we achieve each time. And that's where this digital part of the project comes in, where we're trying to use camera systems to count flowers, to know how many we started with, to count little fruitlets, to know how many we have, and then to make our decisions at 12 millimeters of how much thinner to put on. Now this year, my trials at Geneva show that all the thinning happened at that petal fall spray, whether you put it on Thursday or Monday, that's when we got all the thinning. Very little happened, whatever you did after that, because of the heat. Well, I did want to add one more thing to the heat. The heat in and of itself is like a thinning spray. So if you sprayed on Thursday, it's like you resprayed on Monday. Back-to-back -back thinning sprays give you massive thinning. That's what we had. We had the chemical working Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And then another event, the heat, giving us thinning for the next four days. And that often resulted in over thinning, particularly with honey crisp, if you use relatively high rates of NA. But then on to the second part of the project, and that's using digital tools to count the number of fruits and help guide what we're doing. Now, this leads to a very interesting and, I think, exciting prospect. And that is, if we can count flowers, we can map this orchard, and we can have a GPS-coordinated digital map in a computer file showing for every tree how many flower clusters it has. Or at least we can say this has a lot, this has medium, and this has few. That then can lead to what we call variable rate spraying with ATS at bloom or variable rate spraying with NA and 7 after bloom, where the sprayer would be controlled by the map. And the sprayer would go down the row, turn on, on a tree with heavy bloom with a lot of ATS, give a medium dose on a tree with medium flowered numbers, and no ATS on a tree with no blossom. Now, those of you who have honey crisp know that if you walk down the road, it's always very deep. So this is really the holy grail or what we're really after. It's been very exciting to, to work on this, but we're still not there yet. But the concept of variable rate spraying for thinning based on a computerized digital map from a camera system is where we're headed. Now, this year we worked with two companies. We worked with Vivid Machines out of Ontario, and this is where, uh, Jenny, you can raise your hand. You're kind of short. I want you to come up. <laughs> you can come up, please. And we've worked with Alfield out of the UK and either Ollie or who, Ollie, you, you're going to come up. You're taller, so they will <laughs> So in both of these cases, we were using their systems to map the orchard. Now, I want to introduce my postdoc, whose name is Brian Lawrence. He's doing all of this work. I'm going to turn it over to him, and I'm going to take my chair over there and listen. But I do want to say that I hope, well, I'll just tell you, I told other people already, right, I'm retiring in two and a half years. I hope in two and a half years you're all got some sort of a computer control sprayer and your variable rate spray ATS and variable rate spray post bloom thinners, whether it's NA and Carbril or Maxell and Carbril or Seed or Brevis or whatever you're doing. Those of you that are the lunch stop saw the HSS system. That's the, are they Dutch? Where is Bartlett people? They're Dutch. 
they have a computer controls prayer, whether the single row or the triple row, and they actually did some trials with Vivid, which uh, we'll talk about in a minute. And also, the other company from the Netherlands, the Munkoff company, has been working with Aria Imaging. And our local representative is Ross. Grants, you want to raise your hand? Are you got Aria people here? Yeah, we have both uh, Hans Schmidt from uh, Munkoff is here, as well as Joost from Aria Imaging. Thanks, Terrence. All right, I have a question for everybody. It's really hard to speak after Terrence, so I have that opportunity. But I'm going to continue what he was talking about and go into depth about uh, these three trials. You guys can not stand up here anymore. <laughs> but please talk to these individuals if you're interested more in their technologies afterwards. So I have a question for you guys. Back in 2005 or 2006, how many of you went out and bought a new iPhone? Version 1. Raise of hands. We got the I, the first generation. Well, you guys are Apple people. <laughs> well, in more than one way, too. Uh, sorry. Okay, that's dad joke number one. Who got the second version of the iPhone? Okay. Who got the third version? Do you guys remember the first iPhone that you got? Third version? I think mine was the fifth or sixth version of the iPhone. When um, Steve Jobs stood up on the stage in 2007 and said, this is the future, I didn't believe him. And I feel, in part, that we're at a crux, or that Terrence has been talking about for years. I'm new to this game as far as the opportunities of technology in orchards, but I am a recent convert to the reality that you can either buy the iPhone, or the smartphone, I should say. I won't be exclusive here. Who got the, what's the other one? Android. Who got first generation Android? OK. Very few numbers, right, jumped on board. But once enough people did that, the whole society changed. We have an opportunity to support certain industries that are promoting these technologies that can help us tremendously as growers, but we have to kind of get behind the eight ball. So that's my personal take on it. And our role here as, as research institutions is to partner with them and, and find ways that you can then not only trust their products, but have, have results that, that uh, protect you guys from from uh, issues that we've had this year, such as weather. So yeah, there always will be these variables that we can't control, but the ones that we can are good. I'm going to start with, there's three themes. The first thing I'm going to start is not with the paper. The first thing I'm going to talk about is our partnership with Aria Imaging. And we had a small trial here in the orchard. We had spray cards out in some trees. And we're hoping to repeat this this fall because we really want to figure out exactly how to pair the Aria Imaging with the 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 tractor or the variable rate sprayer. As Terrence has mentioned, this is, this is up and coming research. You want to have more of those trials upcoming. That's the first thing. Second thing I'm going to turn to is uh, these, these handouts. If you haven't gotten one, I have QR codes on the floor. If you aren't an adopter of a smartphone, you won't be able to use that <laughs> QR code. All right, let's look at vivid technologies first. This is a double sided handout if you have one of the paper copies. The first thing we did this year, once we had our Vivid camera, it was after Bloom, and we were looking at, um, at, at Fruitlands. And this first graphic that's very large, on the bottom of that graphic, you can see the average Fruitlet number that Vivid scanners were calculating on all of these trees in this entire block. So eight rows of trees behind me, the ones with the pink labels, and then these first two over by the, the side road. The thin, not the thin, excuse me, the lighter colored graphic lines are further back in time. The further we get to the what would be the 11th of June date, which was actually the target that we hit for Bobby here, we scan quite often, but you can see how that number of average fruitlets transitions to a higher number of trees within this orchard block that has that target number. That red apple on the x-axis was Bobby's 65 count that Terrence and Bobby mentioned earlier. And you can see by 11th of June, we hit that. Now, there is variability within these scans. But one month later, in July 8th, we came back out. We took another scan with the Vivid camera. And you can see that the much larger fruit that is now arguably more accurate with their system is showing that we're hitting that target value that Bobby wants. So this is a great way of showing that if you are wondering if you are hitting your target over a large block, we were able to achieve that with, with Vivid. Now, Vivid has a long way to go and before we can see tree to tree, but overall the, the accuracy was very high on aggregate across the whole block for hitting the target. 
I've written a few things there to sort of describe the graph. I'm not going to necessarily say some of those, uh, like the, the dates, because Bobby already mentioned them. He did spray twice with NAA, and that would be the thinning sprays that caused this giant shift in addition to the heat. Uh, but yeah, if you're looking at 85% of your trees having your target number, those are numbers that would probably make the browns pretty happy. The last thing is, for, uh, is outfield, and I actually don't have that sheet of paper, but that's okay. I have it memorized in my mind. <laughs> so for those who have it, look at it, and or the second QR code is something you can scan to look at the, the outfield chart. I haven't uh, had an opportunity to introduce Daniel. Daniel was instrumental this summer, uh, working sort of simultaneously with multiple products, uh, pr um, programs, excuse me. And this is something that uh, Daniel loves to do. He loves flying the drone. When I arrived last summer, I told Terrence very explicitly, I said, Terrence, I'm not interested in technology. That was before I was converted. I said, mainly I'm not interested because I'm not smart enough to use technology. Well, it turns out that we bought an off-the-shelf drone, and uh, I'm really not as smart as I look. It's easy. You're easily able to fly a drone like this with a, kind of a push of a button, and it's very safe as well. This whole block behind us is about eight and a half acres, and I could fly that block within about eight minutes. And uh, Daniel and I would come up here in the summertime and take data very quickly, and we'd upload that data onto the Outfield website, and then they return that data within about 24 hours. And so then if you are a grower, especially as, as Outfield moves forward and they're looking for variable rate spraying options, you could quickly turn around and then go into the orchard block with the heat maps they generate. If you're looking at that piece of paper, you'll see there's two heat maps that I was taking this spring. The first one's pink, the second one's blue. It's not a gender reveal party, but the one that is pink is blossom map, and the second one that's blue is your fruit prediction. If you were in first grade and you were to find an image from those maps, you might see sort of the shape of an, a W or maybe three lines within it. That's reflecting the variable um, fruit load and or blossom count that were on the two cultivars that are behind us within the Fuji and the Honeycrisp.